Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about some advanced topics in linear algebra. And in today's part 45, we continue our discussion about some important matrix decompositions. Namely, it's about the so-called Schur decomposition, also known as the Schur triangulation. It has a quite simple formulation because it just states that every square matrix over the complex numbers is unitarily similar to an upper triangular matrix. Indeed, what this actually means, we will clear up in this video, but first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. And with that, I would say, let's immediately start explaining the difference to the already known Jordan normal form decomposition. This one states that every square matrix A with complex entries can be written as a matrix product such that A is similar to a Jordan normal form. So more concretely, we just have an invertible matrix X and a Jordan normal form such that we have A is equal to X times J X inverse. And there you already know, the Jordan normal form J is a special upper triangular matrix. And there you already recognize that the Schur decomposition is not so different, because this one is also about an upper triangular matrix. However, there we don't have a special form anymore, we just have any upper triangular matrix in the middle. And there you might already guess, the catch is that the matrix X gets better in this case of the Schur decomposition. In fact, in the case of the Schur decomposition, X is not just an invertible matrix, but also unitary. And therefore the common name for this matrix is U, and instead of U inverse, we can write U star. And usually the upper triangular matrix in the middle is denoted by capital R. And that's all, these are the two ingredients of the Schur decomposition. We have a matrix R, where all the entries below the diagonal are equal to zero. And moreover, our matrix U is unitary, which means that the columns form an orthonormal basis of Cn. And in that case, if we speak of an orthonormal basis, we obviously mean with respect to the standard inner product of Cn. Moreover, here you immediately see the advantage of having a unitary in the decomposition, because the inverse is really easy to calculate. The inverse of u is simply the adjoint of u, which is no problem in calculations. Okay, so this was the introduction, and now let's formulate everything as a theorem. Indeed, as for the Jordan normal form, we have to go to the complex numbers, because only over the complex numbers the decomposition always exists. The problem for the real numbers is always the same, namely that a real valued matrix can also have proper complex eigenvalues. Therefore it's much easier to formulate everything just for the complex numbers. And as already mentioned, the Schur decomposition is quite simple, we just get the existence of a unitary matrix U and an upper triangular matrix R. And then what we get is the similarity relation as we have already mentioned before. So you could simply say, a is similar to an upper triangular matrix R. However, this is not a new result because the Jordan normal form already tells us that. The new thing is it is similar where the transformation matrix is unitary. And only in that case we call the upper triangular matrix R a sure normal form. So this is a new name and please note that in general a sure normal form is not uniquely determined. So definitely a given matrix A could have different sure normal forms. So the important thing you should remember is that A is always unitarily similar to an upper triangular matrix which we call the sure normal form. And as a remark, the whole thing also works just with real numbers if all the eigenvalues of the matrix A are also real numbers. And in that case also U and R can also be chosen as matrices over the real numbers. And moreover, since we have the similar relation, we also know that the eigenvalues of A and R are exactly the same. So the conclusion is that all the eigenvalues of A are be found on the diagonal of R. This is a common thing with a triangular matrix, 
the eigenvalues are always on the diagonal. And obviously there you see the best case would be that R is actually a diagonal matrix. This is a special case which we actually have for normal matrices A. However, this is a topic for another video because in this one I want to show you the proof of the sure decomposition. Actually, this one is not so complicated because it just works by an induction over the dimension n. In fact, if n is equal to 1, the decomposition is already given. So in order to finish the proof, you just have to know the induction step and I show you this one in all details now. The idea is quite simple, just take any eigenvalue from A and call it lambda 1. This one always exists and it has at least one corresponding eigenvector. And this given eigenvector we will call x1. And since it cannot be the zero vector, we are always able to scale it such that the length is equal to 1. So we take the standard norm of Cn and put in x1 and we want that this is equal to 1. So this is always possible and needed because we want to have an O and B for our matrix U. So we just have to add more vectors to x1 such that we get an O and B of Cn. And maybe let's call these additional vectors y2, y3 and so on. Obviously we need exactly n vectors and they should be orthogonal to each other and normalized. And there you should know it's no problem at all to create such an O and B because on the one hand we have our Steinix exchange lemma which helps us to create a new basis and on the other hand we have the famous Kram schmidt process which transforms every basis into an O and B. So the existence of such a basis is not a problem and now we can put these vectors into the columns of a matrix. Hence we get a unitary matrix and we call it U1. And now most importantly the first column of this new matrix is given by our eigenvector x1. And the other y vectors are not so important, it's just important that we get a unitary matrix in the end. So again, the important property of u1 is if you apply it to the standard canonical unit vector e1, then we get out the eigenvector x1. And this is the property we can use to transform our matrix A. So as always we apply our similar relation which means u1 inverse times a times the matrix u1. Hence the matrix product on the right tells us that the matrix A acts in the columns of u1. And crucially there it also acts on x1. So we get a matrix where the first column is ax1. And again the other columns are not so important, we have a y2, a y3 and so on. And now we can just use the fact that x1 is an eigenvector of a. Which means the first column is not changed in the direction, it's just scaled by lambda 1. And then in the next step we can just let u1 inverse act on the columns as well. And there we can use the fact that u1 inverse of x1 is equal to e1. Hence the first column here is just lambda 1 times e1. And as before the other columns are not so important for us, we can just multiply them by u1 inverse. And with that we have the resulting form of our matrix we are interested in. And there the first column tells us that we have lambda 1 in the upper left corner and then just zero underneath. And then the other columns give us something we don't care so much about, so I just put stars there to denote that there is something but we don't know it. However, what we also find then is a square matrix in this corner. And the size of this new matrix is reduced by 1, so we have n minus 1 times n minus 1. Therefore it makes sense to call this matrix A2 and continue all the steps with this reduced matrix. So there you see the induction step. Now we have a new square matrix which is smaller than the original one. And moreover we can still find an eigenvalue which we can call lambda 2. So again we use a normalized eigenvector x2 and repeat all the steps from before. 
So this brings us to a unitary matrix U2 and a decomposition for A2. This means we can also write U2 inverse times A2 times U2. And by the same reasoning as before, we have a matrix where lambda 2 is in the corner and a reduced matrix A3. So there the dimension is already at n minus 2. Hence we can repeat the whole thing many times until we reach the dimension 1 times 1. So the last step is just a n which is a 1 times 1 matrix. So the only entry there is the eigenvalue lambda n and the unitary matrix u n can be chosen as 1. In other words, in this case we don't have to do anything anymore. So you see, the proof to get our triangular matrix is almost finished, we just have to formulate the correct unitary matrix u. In fact, this is the final definition, we have to put all the unitary matrices from before together. And of course the order is important here, first we have our unitary matrix u1. And now in the next step we have to multiply it with u2, however this does not work because u2 is smaller in the dimension than u1. And in order to solve this problem we just add a 1 in the corner. Seeing that as a block matrix we now have the correct size. And it also acts like we want to have it, u2 only operates on a2 in the bottom right corner. And of course we just do the same for u3, u4 and so on, we just have to add more ones in the top left corner. And finally in the last step with un we just have the identity matrix. And here please note, this product is still a unitary matrix because if we multiply unitary matrices we get out a unitary matrix again. So this is not a problem. And now we can just do the matrix product of u star a u. And since we have a unitary matrix we can also write the inverse instead of the adjoint. So the implication of that is that we have the inverses in the other order on the left and the normal order on the right which means in the middle we always have the correct combination which we already know. So for example here in the first step we get our matrix A2 in the right bottom. And then in the next step the matrices will not change the lambda 1 entry but u2 will act on A2. And then we can just repeat the whole thing and in the end we get our upper triangular matrix. And we also see that the eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2 and so on are on the diagonal. And by construction we know that we have the zeros below the diagonal but we don't know what happens above the diagonal. And there we have our result, this upper triangular matrix is what we call R. So you see this was a whole construction procedure and it finishes our proof. Obviously you can shorten the proof and just show the induction step to have a formal proof by induction. However I wanted to show you the whole construction procedure because this is what you would do in calculations. And indeed how this works in an explicit example I can show you with the next video. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.